Shabbat Shalom and greetings to the 12 tribes, all of you guys out there scattered abroad. Baruch Hashem, Yahuwah, bless the name of Yahuwah and edify one another in the live chat today. Give us some thumbs up, subscribe to the ministry, ministry channel right now, won't you? And please look in the description because you'll find that you can register for Passover coming up here in a few weeks. Blessings upon you all. We are in the book of Vaikra, Leviticus, Vaikra, and he called. So let's turn there. It comes to us from Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, and our Torah portion extends through chapter 6 and verse 7. Ends up in the King Jimmy as Leviticus, which of course comes from the Latin and the Greek translation that was translated into the Latin about Levites. But that's somewhat misleading, which I think then causes and has caused religion to kind of put the book on the shelf. And it's something that really isn't read that often, because, well, that's just for the Levites. But hang on a minute. It's not called Leviticus, really. It's Vaikra. And Yahweh called. Are you called? For many are called, but few are chosen. Are you chosen to have your life transformed by this book? Well, hang on a minute. It's in the book of the law. It can't transform our lives. Yes, it can when we approach it through the book of the covenant, using book of the covenant eyes to glean out the commandments. There's a few things that we've got to frame before we dive into this book. But to call it Leviticus, it's going to end up dusty on the shelf. Because this is not about Levites. This is about the called and the chosen. The called and chosen generation. That's you. That's this generation that you're here with Torah to the tribes seeking the commandments of Yahweh. This is our book. This is our calling because it is a, a book about Kedushah. Holiness, sanctification coming out of her, my people. It's a brain cleanse, it's a body cleanse. It is a full cleanse in Yahweh from this sick and twisted world. So if you don't think that we need this book, we need it, especially in a time when the world and the governments are trying to encroach upon our borders and upon our bodies. This is a time of sanctification to push back because our rights are not from governments. Our rights do not come from men. They are from Yahuwah. In fact, let me hit you up with just three simple scriptures just to set that in motion because so many of us have been mistaught and think that we have to go to men. No, we don't go to government. Government's supposed to come to us, the people. We get our rights from our Creator. It is written in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and the 19th verse. Very important. Cursed is the one who perverts the rights due to the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. That's a serious charge. How about the next one I may have for you? Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8. Open your mouth for those who have no voice. That's my job. Some of you don't have the stomach to go and have to face what needs to be faced. And that's okay. I will go before you. And you will have others that will go before you. But that's my calling, is to go before those that don't have the voice, that don't have the stomach to stand. And that's okay. Not everybody does. But I do. And it says right here, open your mouth for those without a voice. For the rights of all who are downtrodden. 
Listen to that. Where do the rights come from? They come from Yahuwah, from our Creator. Stand for the cause of the poor and needy and speak out for justice. This is powerful. This is the day and age when we need people, not just me, to rise up and to stand and speak for those who do not have a voice. We need to fight for the rights of the down and out. We need to speak out for justice and we need to stand for the cause of the poor and needy. That is Vaikra. And he called. One more scripture and then we'll get into the portion. Because this is very, very pertinent to what we're about to dive into in this day and age. This book, Vaikra, is powerful. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 34. It is written, To crush under one's feet all the prisoners of of the earth and they would like to make you all prisoners in this earth in the big global prison system where by 2030 you'll own nothing and you'll be happy that's the plan that's the great reset that's the agenda to crush under one's feet all the prisoners of the earth to deny a man his rights or deprive a man of justice. Yahuwah does not approve, and neither should we. The book of Vaikra is powerful because it is a calling for justice. It is a calling that our rights are not given to us by governments. They are not given to us by men. We do not have to ask for something that we already have attained. Our rights are from Yahuwah, and He is our defense, our shield, and our buckler. And you need men and women to be able to vocalize that and stand for those of you that cannot stand yet or maybe once stood but have become weakened because of age, because of sickness, whatever. It is our duty and responsibility to take care of you, to help you, to aid you, and assist you. And that's my commitment here at Torah to the Tribes. I want to gather in the 12 tribes scattered abroad, and I want to help all of those that are downtrodden, all of those that have needs, because this is the time when we must do it in this day. Vaikra, to those that are called, to those that are called. It's a book about holiness and sacrifice, purity of life, sanctification. Come out of her, my people. We need to be distinct from this world. It's purity of life. It's purity of action. It's thoughts befitting a priestly nation. That's what Yahushua communicated in the Beatitudes in, Ma in Matthew chapter 5. That is what is spoken to the churches in Giliana, Revelation chapter 2. The divine call of this book is what? Leviticus chapter 11 verse 4. It's embedded in the midst of the dietary laws. Why? It's embedded in the midst of the Sabbath. Be holy, for I am holy. It's echoed in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. This book just has the fragrance of the prayers of the saints, holiness. When you are in a world where governments and men are trying to coerce people to be unholy, to defile their bodies, to corrupt their minds, and to give up the rights that don't come from government, they come from your Creator. Do you think we need this book? Do you think we need this instruction? I know I do. 
Because I and you are called, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, be a living sacrifice. So we're going to read a lot about sacrifices, but ultimately you and I need to be a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Sometimes men, women, those of you that will stand and can stand with me, you're going to have to put yourself deliberately, intentionally, intelligently, and willfully in difficult, hard, pressing situations so that you can speak for those who do not have a voice. So that you can stand for the, the, the poor, for the widow, for the afflicted, for the sick that are with us. Because Amalek is on our heels. And we have a command from Yahuwah to take care of our people. And they're coming. They're coming. And it's going to take strength and an army of righteousness and righteous people to stand. That is my calling, and I am calling you to be a part of that call. Rise up, men and women. And if you don't have the capacity in you to rise up because you are weak and afflicted, there's no shame in that. You are to be honored and assisted and aided in your trials because others can assist you in the tribehood of Israel. That's what we're supposed to be as a people. Man, I'm just getting going. <laughs> Chapter 1, and Yahuwah Vaikra, and Yahuwah called. He's called us to lay down our lives for one another, to love our neighbor as ourself. There's no greater honor for me to stand and to take the pain and to take the punishment, and it could be because I just don't feel worthy. Is it self-flagellation? Whatever it is. If that's what it needs to be to help people, there's nothing that you and I can do that's going to make us righteous. But if we can stand in harm's way to help somebody, that's going to help a lot, isn't it? Well, those days are coming, my friends. Those days are coming. And I'm not all about the tribulation, even though I am. But, you know, I went through the book of Revelation. If you actually look in the Torah scroll, you'll find a little marking in the text. It's called one of the titles of Moshe, one of the titles of Moshe. You see that the Aleph is made very small deliberately. And you'd be reading, you go, why did they make the Aleph really small? Well, we know that an Aleph, the pictograph, is an ox, right? What does it mean? It's saying for us to really get any value out of this book, we have to make our strength small. We have to humble ourselves. Because if we're pri oh, I, the book of Leviticus, <laughs> the Torah, the law's done away with. I've got Jesus now. I don't need none in it. Well, that's kind of prideful, isn't it? Because now you've got your greasy grace and you don't think you need the laws of Yahweh. Well, guess what? You're going to be under the laws of men then. Good luck to you. You're going to need it as they send you off to the camps. Now, I would rather humble myself before the almighty Yahuwah and follow his laws. Would you far, rather follow the laws and decrees of men or would you rather follow the commandments of the living Elohim? Who's going to be more merciful to you? Yahuwah. I would rather fall into the hands of a merciful Elohim than into the hands of men. Because men are unmerciful. Unmerciful. So we need to make our olive small. We need to humble ourselves. And when Yahweh calls somebody, that person's strength needs to be made small and humble. And if we're not called by Yahweh to a life of faith, it's because we haven't been humble to see. Oh, oh my goodness, I am a filthy sinner. And that should break you. That should break you. I mean, I'm, I'm aggressive, I'm bold, I'm courageous. I, I know and many people think, oh, well, Matthew. But I tell you what, when I look at myself, I am humbled. Because I know that I am a sinner. And because of that, my strength when I was 24 
was broken. And it was made small. And if we don't approach Yahweh in humbleness, if we don't approach this book in humbleness, then we will never get the blessings that he has bestowed before us. And if, like the church, you approach this book in pride, oh, well, it's done away with, you know, the laws of Moses are done away with, it's nailed to the cross, we've got Jesus, and we've got bacon and beans for the potluck after church, that's a dusty book, we'll leave it on the shelf. You'll take issue with every single commandment in this book. You'll approach it with pride. Oh, we've got something way better than that now. It's the book of Romans. On the book of Romans says, be a living sacrifice. So maybe we need to flip the theology on its head and be called and be chosen. Now, reading this book, we really do need to do a self-examination before we embark on the book so that we can receive the instructions. Because obviously we're not going to go out there, well, I hope it's obvious to you, and go and slaughter a, a, an animal and go put it on an altar. We're not going to go and do that, though some messianics have uh, tried such things in the past. We need to internalize it, and we need to apply it as the Romans chapter 12 living sacrifices that we are. So we have to internalize the commandments, and we need to apply it. But how do we do that? Well, firstly, we have to establish what Yahushua did die for, and what Yahushua did not die for. Because if you can't establish that parameter before you jump into this book, you're going to be confused. And the next thing, you're going to be going up the Messianic hill for Passover, and you're going to be dressing up a lamb and putting a crown of thorns on it and draping a robe over it, and everybody's going to be dressing up like Levi priests, worshipping the thing. And that's been done before. And that's called an abomination. So first of all, what did Yahushua die for? And what did Yahushua not die for? We need to read the book of Vayikra through covenant eyes. Through covenant eyes. So keep in mind three things as you study Vayikra so you can glean the commandments out of the text while simultaneously acknowledging that Yahushua died for our sins. The Bible does not, and I'm going to offend some people, the but, I know I'm going to offend some people, the Bible does not teach he died so we wouldn't have to keep the commandments, like Sabbath, purity, the dietary commandments, and the feasts of Yahweh. The Bible doesn't teach that. Three things. Number one, Yahushua is our eternal sacrifice. Number two, Yahushua transferred us into an eternal priesthood. And number three, he constructed a new temple. That's it. He is our eternal sacrifice. He transferred us into our higher realm of priesthood and he constructed a new tabernacle. Acts 15, the fallen tabernacle of David is raised up. Reconciliation to Yahuwah are only by those three things. You don't get reconciled to Yahuwah because you're not going to eat pork anymore. Now, will that be beneficial to your body and purity? Yes. But you don't get wrecked. Oh, well, now I'm reconciled to Yahuwah because now I no longer eat pork. No. Oh, I'm reconciled to Yahuwah now because I keep Shabbat. Well, no, 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 no. You don't get saved by keep. So, therefore, those things wouldn't be done away with, would they? We're talking about reconciliation. And for that to be reconciled, there is always a transformation to a higher, higher order. Does that make French? Donnie, make French? Are you sticking with me today? 
Okay, I need a little sprayer to keep you with me. So, reconciliation to Yahweh were accomplished by the eternal sacrifice, the transference to the higher priesthood, and the construction of a new tabernacle. These were the objects of atonement for sin. Sabbath wasn't an object for atonement for sin. The dietary requirements weren't an object for atonement for sin. Having pure, pure and proper sexual relations weren't an object for atonement for sin. So those things aren't done away with. Right? The objects of atonement for sin within this book are going to be transferred to a higher order, right? Their application is going to go to a, a higher priesthood, a higher temple, and a eternal sacrifice. So you have to, I mean, this is kind of big concepts, but it'll rework your brain so that you can glean all of the commandments out of the book without falling into a Levitical hierarchy. Those were the objects of atonement for sin fulfilled and transferred to a higher order by Yahushua. So think about it. Keeping Shabbat, observing purity, observing the feasts, keeping the dietary requirements and so on have nothing to do with atonement for sin. Are we clear on that? Nothing to do with atonement for sin. So they wouldn't be done away with then, would they? I mean, if this was, this is very, very simple when I break it down like this. And if this was taught in the church, you'd be like, well, hang on, that makes sense. Yeah. Jesus died not to clean animals. Didn't you who should die so that Cornelius, who was viewed as an animal, an unclean Gentile, could come into the faith? Isn't it about cleaning people? And all of a sudden we've relegated Yahusha's blood to cleaning pigs? What's up with that? That's a defamation of character, if you ask me. They're defaming our Lord. But they're not intentionally doing it. They've been hoodwinked. Hoodwinked. Yahushua did not end these commandments. Now, if, on the other hand, you look to animal sacrifices, now here's the flip side. If you, on the other hand, look to animal sacrifices, like many in the Messianic movement and Judaism do, and you look to a Levitical priesthood, and you look to a Jewish temple, post-crucifixion and post-resurrection, then, when, then... Uh, well, then that's when you risk encroaching upon the blood of Yahushua, Hebrews 10, verse 26, and risk putting his sacrifice, priesthood, and temple to an open shame. And that should bring great fear and sobriety. Think about that. And Yahweh Vaikra called to Moshe and spoke to him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man of you bring an offering to Yahuwah, any man, even some heathen, some pagan, could have been traveling along in the desert, come to a well named after one of the attributes of Yahuwah, and he said, Oh, I'm going to go follow that Elohim. Even he, meaning there is neither male or female, slave or free. We are all one in Mashiach Yahushua. That's equality. That's equity. That's the Torah. It comes from the Torah. Even a, fa even a heathen could come into the faith. A man's faith isn't the accident of his birth. It's not about genealogies. It's not about doing a DNA test, even though they'll want to do that to you anyway to get you into their prison system. We don't go after endless genealogies. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Then it goes on to say in verse 2, You shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. So here is an example. It was only domesticated animals. Why? Because it has to cost you something. A sacrifice needs to be of cost. You're not just going to go and nick some 
animal from the wilderness, that didn't cost you anything. It needs to be of your domesticated flock. It needs to cost you personally. It can't be wild. It can't be stolen. Later, the prophets actually rebuked Israel because they would go and steal somebody else's flock. And remember David and Nathan gave him the analogy when he went into Bathsheba about a man stealing another's kid, right? Remember that? Yeah? Well, again, Israel fell for this later on. And of course, it was only a tahor, only a clean animal that could be blessed. Otherwise, it's an abomination. So, you know, sitting around and, and, and having a, a, a blessing over the Easter ham, uh, that, that, that doesn't work. Job says, can Yahweh make the clean come out of the unclean? No. If it's unclean, that is a status. And you can't change that. You know, a snake is a snake is a snake. A pig is a pig is a pig. It's always going to be teme, unclean. It's not going to miraculously become clean, no matter how many times you scrub and wash it. Verse 3. And if his offering be a burnt offering of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Yahuwah. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make a keporah, a covering or atoning for him. And he shall kill the bull before Yahuwah and the Kohanim, the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. Now, what would happen here is the flame would pass between the pieces. What would that symbolize? That would symbolize the covenant of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, the covenant in chapter 15 of Genesis. That is symbolized through the sacrificial system. Now, I think that's powerful because that's the or origination of the covenant. Because this was all put in as a schoolmaster and a tutor to try and bring us back into the book of the covenant. But the only way that could happen is the true sacrifice came to connect us back. Verse 7. And the sons of Aaron, the Kohen, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the Kohenim, the priests, Aaron's son, shall lay the pieces, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire that is upon the altar. Now, this is interesting if you look at this as, as in, you know, using analogy and metaphor and Yahushua being the sacrifice that was laid upon the wood, laid upon the beams, if you will, and he was taken outside of the gate, who would be able to handle the sacrifice according to the Torah? Well, I'm glad you asked. Only a member of the council of the 24 priestly courses could handle the sacrifice. And you'd find that in First Chronicles chapter 24. So, who was Joseph of Arimathea? And who was Nick at night? They were both members of the council of 24 priestly courses. So they were able to handle Yahushua's sacrificial body before... In the interim, before he sat down. Because for a sacrifice to be fully consumed and accepted, key word, accepted, my legal friends here who are watching will know what I'm talking about, accepted. It has to be handled properly. And Yahushua had not yet sat down. The sacrifice is not fully consumed and accepted until 
there is the seating down. So it better be handled appropriately. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were those two men qualified according to First Chronicles chapter 24. Powerful! Many are Vaikra called, but few are chosen. Well, those two were chosen. They were called and they were chosen. Matthew chapter 20 verse 16 is what I'm referencing. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, if you go back to the grain offerings, that's where this comes from. Because what would happen at the time of harvest, they would, it would take about 10 omers that would be bound up. The 10 omers would be bound up after threshing. And then they would be beaten and they would be refined. And out of that 10 omers, there'd only be about one omer that was suitable for an offering. So think about that. I think about all the faces that I've seen, all the people that I've taught over all the years. I'm like, where did they go? And now there's so many more of you that are coming in. But we must remain vigilant and sober because many are called. That's the 10. But after we get beaten, after we get smashed, after we get crushed, after this world comes upon us and we get threatened and we're put under duress and we are put in very tough spots. And some of us intentionally choose to put us in those spots themselves, like moi, because it makes me stronger. If there's an easy way out or a harder way, I will always take the harder way. Oh, it's much easier if I did that. Oh, well, I'm going to do the hard way. Why? Because I know from experience that through the fire and through the pain, Yahweh is, I experience him more. I experience his power more. And I become less dependent upon myself and I see miracles. But it does take some stomach. But it's worth it to me. And that's not everybody. But that's, that's the sum of you that are going to be able to help those of our brethren that don't have that capacity. And not everybody can have that. But those that don't have it, they need people like us to nurture and care for them. Especially in these days to come. As people come up to me and say, well, Matthew, I, I, I couldn't do what you're doing. I, I mean, I don't want to have to go and go through what you go through and go speak to those people like you speak to and, and then stand up. And I'm like, well, you don't have to. I'll go do it for you. That's what I'm for. I'll take the hit. It's worth it to me to have a whole house of Israel coming out of slavery. It's worth it to me. It's powerful stuff, isn't it? We live in such an amazing time. But of those ten omers that are called after the beating, after the refining, after all of that, only one omer would be left. Many depart. So we've got to be buttressed up. We've got to be fortressed up. Many are called, but few are chosen. In chapter 1, we have the burnt offering. It's called an ola, an ascension. It means to ola, to ascend. It was a voluntary sacrifice. It was distinct from an obligatory sacrifice. It was for a worshiper, oh, to draw close unto Yahuwah, to have that intimate fellowship with <coughs> Yahuwah. Whenever a man's consciousness prompted him, if he was feeling distant from his Elohim, estranged. You know, sometimes you're like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have watched that movie. Ah, oh, and you kind of feel estranged. Or maybe you overdosed on news that day and you're like, ah, oh, I wasn't in the word as much as I should have been. I feel estranged. Come on. Am I the only one? I'm the only one. I, well, if, if there's one of you out there that, you know, and you feel estranged, then what would you do? Okay, so how do we apply this? We drop to our knees as living sacrifices and we ola, we ascend, we lift our hands in prayer, we lift our voice in song. Right, Moshe? Right, Moshe? In song. Does your father love to sing? Yes, your father loves to sing. I make a glorious noise. And it's worship unto Yahweh, and I don't care that you're laughing at me. 
I have, we have this thing in my house that if you don't sing when it's time for the holy blessings, that I threaten my children. Threats. I put them under duress and then I coerce them. And if they still don't give in, we make an appointment with a choir director at one of the colleges. And I do this, but I threaten my children. And Moshe wouldn't sing. So we took him to the choir boy. And he had choir lessons. And how many times did it take you? Twice. Oh, and it was fun. I was sitting out there and he's like, la, da, da, da. And Moshe's in, la, da, da. We're going to go back. So anyway, it was just a few weeks ago, my youngest son, Levi, he wasn't singing at the Shabbat table. I said, do you want to get booked? Is he? Does he have an appointment? He did sing, didn't he? Yeah, he did. But I threatened him, put him under severe duress and coerced him that if he didn't sing, he was going to choir lessons. So anyway, it's good to sing. I lose my train of thought. I'm sorry. Ascending, chapter 1, the burnt offering. It was open to all men, even the believing heathen from foreign countries like myself. Wild branches that were grafted in. I'm a Yah-fearer, right? A Cornelius, that which was a stranger and far off, grafted in as a homeborn, as a homeborn. Chapter 2, we have the grain offering. In the Hebrew, it's called the mincha, the mincha. And it comes from another Hebrew word, nacha, nacha, which means to lead. And it was a bloodless sacrifice. And when any will offer a grain offering, a mincha, to Yahuwah, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense on it, and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the Kohanim. So, you know, take some of this, and you're like, okay, it's Shabbat. I'm going to pour myself a nice bath. I'm going to put some frankincense in it. Some Epsom salt, you know. I'm a living sacrifice. I'm telling you. I mean, there, you can glean all of the wonderful stuff of the Torah out of it. Obviously, I'm not going to start self-mutilating myself. You know, Paul says, do not do that. You know, I'm not going to make myself a... I'm not going to start, you know, like they used to do back in the times of the Knights Templar where they do a little bit of self-flagellation. I mean, but they took it too far, didn't they? But you can see that you can glean the wonderful mitzvot out of it. You pour oil on it with all the frankincense, and the Kohen, the priest, shall burn the remembrance portion of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet fragrance. And our prayers are the sweet fragrance that ascend vertically up to Yahuwah. This is the grain offering, the mincha. It means to lead. It was a bloodless sacrifice. Now remember, Cain. Cain brought forth this sacrifice. Cain brought forth the mincha, but Abel brought forth the mincha and the one preceding it, the ohel. So which one was better? Cain just brought the mincha. It was bloodless. But Abel brought forth the mincha and the Ola, which is, of course, the burnt offering. This mincha was a sacrifice for the very poor. A dove, of course, was the offering of the very poor. Why? Because a dove doesn't have the strength to fight back. And there's many doves. And it says Ephraim is like a silly dove. Many of us are Ephraim. And some of you are weaker, not, it, not to put you down, or afflicted, that don't have the strength in these last days. That's why we need to gather in community so those that are strong can help the doves within the community. Ephraim is a dove. 
scattered in the nations, it is written in the word. So we need to take care of the ox and the dove, from the ox to the dove. All Israel needs to be taken care of because Amalek is behind us, trying to sneak up on our rearward parts. So this is a very important sacrifice because Yahuwah would view this sacrifice as if the person that was offering it had offered his very soul on the altar. Now, what was the widow's might? It was the mingha. It was the lowly sacrifice, but it was as if she was offering her very soul. Her very soul. And there's those of you out there that do that. The things that I receive in the mail as offerings. Somebody sent me um, Torah to the tribes a silver spoon. Pure silver from Utah. And it was like, my goodness, so much thought. So much thought. You know, and that had some serious value to it. So we're not to despise the small things, because they are of a great sacrifice. That's what this is about. Now, of course, Yahushua talks about later, about us up upholding this, because we're to be salt and light, and we're not to let our flavor die down. We're to be salty, Matthew 5, Mark 9. Yahushua taught the upholding of the altar system and holiness until the impending change of the transference, Genesis 49.10. Of course, salt is a preservative. We cannot let our flavor be washed away. If ever I become bland, then it's time for me to quit. So I know I have my detractors out there and say, oh, I'm too aggressive or too passionate or whatever. Well, that's, that's just me. I'm fired up and I am, yes, sometimes offensive and salty. But man, if you're not fired up and salty about something, you will get washed away. You will get washed away by the cares of this world. And there's a lot of things to be concerned about in this world. And Russia isn't one of them, okay? I'm just saying. I'm just saying, okay? It's a distraction. The history of the world in this country, of how many, how many years, Moshe, has, this is a, a war country. How many, how many years have we not been at war? Like 20-odd since the, its inception. Because the economy is tanked. Therefore, there has to be a war, right? It was a war on the Rona. Now it's a war on this. You know, it's at all distraction. Don't get caught up in the distraction. You'll get washed away by the cares of the world. We've got to stand and be salty soldiers for Yahuwah. We won't be preserved without the real salt contained in Yahuwah's Torah. That's where the salt is. Yes, in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, it's sweet. And there's a lot of honey in there, and that's good. But you need the salt to be able to stand. Otherwise, you get washed away with the doctrines of men. It's too easy. It's too easy. That's why so many in the church, they shut their doors when they should have stood and be salty in the face of government tyranny. Chapter 3, we have the shalom offering. Hebrew word is shalamin. Shalamin. It was a celebrationary meal taken home from the altar. You'd actually take it off of the altar, take it home and celebrate with your family and friends. And his offering is a sacrifice of the shalom offering. If he offer it from the herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before Yahuwah. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons and the Kohanim shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar all around. Shalom. Shalamin. 
this is a celebrational meal taken from the altar back home because Yahuwah's peace is brought through your gates to your family. That's what we need to do. We need to bring Yahuwah's peace from the altar system of Yahusha into our gates. We need to bring... It's no good you and I saying, oh, we love Yahuwah and we, we're believers. If we're not bringing that peace home with us, if we're not bringing it through our gates to our families, then what is it that we're doing? Because that's the importance. You've got to bring his peace through your gates to your family. And think about that. What's on his table, altar, better be the same as what goes on your table. Okay? So think about that. What's on yours had better match what he puts on his. Pretty simple concept. That would clear up the bacon butties, wouldn't it? The sausage and bangers and mash. When you eat... Prepare your table unto Yahuwah. It's got to be befitting for a king. And I like this, and this is something that the sages would say. If your conversations around the table are not about Yahuwah, his word and prayer, then you haven't brought him into your midst. And I'm guilty. How many times do we sit down and break bread together, but we're chatting it up about just silly things? Worldly things. We really need to think about that. Right? Because that's what the meal is supposed to be about. Chapter 4, we have the sin offering. The Hebrew word there is chata. Chata. It means to remove from life. What does sin do? Sin removes you from life. It starts in pain and it ends in shame. And there's no peace betwixt. That's sin. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel saying, If a being shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of Yahuwah concerning the things which should not be done and shall do any of them, if the anointed priest commits sin like the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish to Yahweh for a sin offering. The sin offering, chata, to remove from life. And that is what sin does. It ends in, James says that sin brings about death. This offering was for a breach of trust unintentional sin. Now this sacrifice precedes the burnt or the ola. So you can see how they all line up together. Time for a cup of tea before we go into chapter 5, the guilt or trespass offering, the asham. My son is the greatest tea maker, I think, Levi really makes a good cup of tea, doesn't he? My wife makes a great cup of tea too, but my, my, young, my youngest, man, he makes a good cup of I'm not picky about how my tea's made. Can you imagine? <laughs> has to be a particular kind of tea bag, has to be steeped at a particular temperature, has to have just, oh, oh my goodness. When I first came over to America, couldn't believe it. They'd bring me these tea bags with a blooming string on it, you know, with a staple in it. I got a sta I got metal in my tea, and then I'd, I'd, I'd well, I need two tea bags, and they'd come out and they'd charge me twice. I'm like, hang on a minute. I ordered a cup of tea. I expect to pay for a cup of tea. Just because you give me one of those lame tea bags on a string, that's not a cup of tea. You can't charge me twice. I, I haven't even had a cup of tea yet. That was half a cup of tea. That argument didn't work very well. That was back in the day when I used to argue. I don't argue anymore. Ask my wife. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. Where are we? 
We're in chapter 5. And if a being sins and hears the voice, oh, this is powerful. This is the asham, the guilt or trespass offering. This was done for ignorant self-destruction or breach of trust. This is very applicable. We're going to see how this works out when Yahushua is before Caiaphas. Because this is what enables the priesthood to be transferred to the Malkitetic order from this Levitical order. And if a being sins, listen, if a being sins and hears the voice of swearing and is a witness, whether he has seen it or known it, if he does not reveal it, then he shall bear his iniquity. This still stands today. Now I have a question for you. How did people get saved back in the Torah? I want to clear up some misunderstandings before we move forward. Chapter 1, Gentiles could offer sacrifices, right? Gentiles could offer sacrifices. Let's be real clear on that. Number In chapter 3, you see that you get to eat your offered sacrifice. It was a shalom offering. You got to take it home. So that shows you that what meat we eat needs to be appropriate. That our grace shouldn't desecrate his altar. That's the problem with the traditional church. They've let the grace desecrate the altar. His meat is our meat, and our meat should be his meat. That's the Torah. There is no sacrifice for willful, defiant sin in all of these sacrifices. Only once a year at Yom Kippur. During the year only, unintentional sin was covered. So if you sinned willfully and defiantly because you stumbled and fell, you would have to sweat it out all the way through the 10 days of awe with fear and trembling that the priest would come out alive after he did the Yom Kippur sacrifice because that was the only sacrifice that would temporarily cover your willful defiant sin. Because all of these sacrifices were for unintentional sin. There's only one once a year. That's a burden. You would have to carry the burden of shame and guilt for the whole year. And then hope that it would be temporarily covered that Yom Kippur. So during the year, only unintentional sin was covered. Think about that. And how was it covered? By faith. You see, they looked back to the Lamb of Elohim's sacrifice that saved them in Egypt. And by faith, they looked forward to the promised intercession of the high priest on Yom Kippur. So they were saved by faith. By faith, they looked back to the Lamb that saved them out of Egypt. And by faith, they looked forward forward to the Yom Kippur sacrifice that would save them from their current willful defiant sin. So it was always about bookends of faith. It was never about works. They were saved the same way we're saved, through faith in the Lamb. But it had to be spelled out for them because they didn't get the redemption process. And it says in the, in the I, in, I think it's Hebrews, that you and I that have not seen with our eyes, have not heard with our ears, we taste salvation. How much greater is that than the ones who actually saw Yahushua with their eyes, heard him with their ears, and put their finger in his side? You and I haven't. And that will be counted toward us in the kingdom because we still have faith but the more you press into the word you do actually see you do actually hear and you do actually touch don't you 
Because I have seen the glory of Yahweh, I have heard the glory of Yahweh, and I have touched the glory of Yahweh. I know that. But that's taken years of discipleship. So this is some powerful stuff. Now, Matthew 26 really speaks about the equation of faith and salvation. Because ultimately, it's Yahusha that brings it all, all together, all-encompassing. But they looked back and they looked forward, back to the Lamb that saved them from Egypt, forward to the promised intercession of the high priest on Yom Kippur. So by faith in the intercession of the Passover Lamb, the high priest and the blood on the mercy seat, this really is the work of redemption. Because, like I said, after Matthew 26, this equation of faith and salvation was removed and unavailable because it transferred into a different altar system. The altar system, the altar system was designed to show our need, to show us Yahweh's mercy, to show us Yahweh's justice. A special kind of sacrifice would be needed to deal with willful, defiant sin that would pass us from this world into the next because none of these sacrifices did they were all about this world but what about the sacrifice that transcends this world that's what we need israel believed that yahuwah would provide that in the future we believe that he has provided it so it's still all about faith now think about this in terms of yahusha using gleaning his equity and equality out of the text, gleaning the messianic redemption out of the text and applying it to Yahusha. Who handled the sacrifice of Yahusha? We already discussed that. The two of the 24 priestly courses, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Was Yahusha taken outside the gate like the offering here? Yes, to the Mount of Olives. And where was he taken? To the place of the burning of the ashes. The Paraduma altar, the altar of the red heifer, was right where Yahusha was crucified. And when that turtle dove its wings, was it split? No. Why not? Because you'd break the bones. In the sacrifice that Avraham flayed open, but he didn't the birds. Why? You try flaying open a little bird, you're going to break its wings. And you, there's no broken bones allowed. And it was on the altar on the east side. This is all so messianic. And that sacrifice would have to be killed, Panaim el Panaim, before the face of Yahweh, not behind his back. So if you look at the, the geography in Jerusalem today, the church of the Holy Sepulchre would be over to Yahweh's left shoulder. That makes no sense. Because if you're in Jerusalem and you've got the Mount of Olives here directly east, well, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is back here. Well, that makes no sense. He couldn't have been crucified there. That's over Yahweh's left shoulder. It has to be Panaim, Panaim. It has to be straight across the Kidron Valley at a slightly elevated site so that the, the temple centurion could see the veil rent. He would have to be looking over the wall directly into the temple, and that would happen if he was at the altar of the red heifer sacrifice, viewing down directly over the eastern gate into the temple. That's the testimony we have in the Brit Hadashah. Isn't that powerful? I went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre when I was 19, 18. I was extremely disappointed. It was so gaudy, so gaudy. He has to be laid in order upon the wood. It has to be washed and prepared in oil or frankincense. The sacrifice would be cut to pieces, scourged, if you will. The fat that covers the kidneys and the flanks would be removed through the scourging. 
blood would be drained from the sacrifice's side. Its crop would be plucked. His beard was plucked. It would be beaten down. He was beaten down. It would be unleavened. And unleavened today we know is striped and pierced. And it was a memorial portion. And it would come from the herd or from the tribe, if you will. Herd and tribe are synonymous. And now you can see what the writer of the book of Hebrews said in the 13th chapter and the 10th verse. We have an altar from which they have no right to eat who serve the earthly tent of meeting. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Yahushua also, that he might be set apart and set apart the people of Israel by his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth therefore to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Now this is an example of the Shalamin offering. It could be eaten from the temple altar. The Mikpat altar on which Yahushua was crucified you have no right to eat from because everything is burnt to ash. And that's the purpose of that altar. You have no right to eat from it. You have to transfer over into the Malkizedic order to have a right to eat from his altars. Does that make sense? That's some powerful stuff. Well, let's finish up in chapter 5 and then see what you have to say in the chat. In fact, I think I'm running out of time. How long have I been going? Yeah, hour and five. It's a, it's a big portion. I'm not used to doing the big portions like this. So chapter five, I already kind of covered it, but I'll read a few uh, for you. And that is, of course, chapter five, the guilt, trespass, a sham offering, which was for ignorant self-destruction and for breach of trust. And of course, this one talks about how there would be the Leviticus chapter 5, if you heard the voice of swearing and you were a witness and you didn't say anything to it, then you would be in sin. So what this talks about is if, if someone swears this oath, like Caiaphas, and you hear them, and you're witness of it, and you know the truth, that you are the Son of Man, and you do not declare it, then you'll be in sin, and you can't be the Messiah. So Yahushua was put under this trespass oath. And Caiaphas did it, and he had to tell what he knew. Now, what happened? We know that there was the renting of the high priest's tunic. But in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6, there is a provision and Moshe said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Itamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither tear your clothes, lest you die. You die if you rip your garments. You rip your priestly garments and you annul your position. You're disqualified from the priesthood and you will die. But Yahweh has a provision because he doesn't want you to you know, be getting changed in the morning and accidentally tear your garment or taking it off at night and accidentally tearing your garment. So there's a provision in Exodus chapter 28, verse 32, where it would be double-stitched around the neck so it wouldn't tear. Now, what's really, really powerful is that we see now in Matthew chapter 26, all of this come to fruition. Because Yahushua was born a king, and he went down into the waters, John the Baptist said, so that he could fulfill all Zadakah, righteousness. So he went into the waters as a king, and he came up fulfilling all righteousness. He went in as a Malki, and he came up as a Malki Zedek. That was the moment of the transference from the proper high priest, who was John the Baptist. He should have been the high priest. There was the transference according to Yahuwah's Torah. But according to the custom... You see, even today we fight custom. 
There's truth and then there's custom. Much of what's going on out in the nations with these laws and these mandates, these are customs. And they, are, they act as if they're law, but they're just custom. But if you let a custom go for so long, it can become a law. So the custom was that Caiaphas was the high priest. The truth, John the Baptist was truly the high priest, according to the genealogies. So there had to be the transference between him and Yahushua, but there also had to be an acknowledgement of the custom, Matthew 26, verse 50, 57. We'll finish up with this, relating it, of course, to the Leviticus chapter 5. And they that had laid hold of Yahushua led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Verse 58. But Peter followed him from afar off to the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the result. Now, the main priests and elders and all the Sanhedrin sought false witnesses against Yahushua to put him to death, but they found none. Yet, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At the end came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of Yahuwah and to build it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you respond? What is all this that these witnesses have said against you? But Yahushua kept his silence. What was that? Yahushua kept his silence. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath. He's putting him under the oath of Leviticus 5 right here. Before the living Elohim, that you tell us whether you are the Mashiach, the son of the Almighty. So right here, Caiaphas invoked the first law of the trespass offering from our Torah portion. He invoked the law of the trespass offering, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. Yahushua had to answer him or he would have been in sin. He would have been a sinner, defiled and disqualified and not able to be the Passover lamb sacrifice. That's a huge concept, isn't it? Just simply here. So Yahushua said, Yahushua said to him, you have said it. Uh Uh-uh, that's not good enough. Well, yeah, you said it, but no, he has to say it according to the oath. So he says this, you have said it, nevertheless, I say to you, I have to be the one that speaks it. After this, you shall see the Son of Man sitting After what? After the sacrifice is fully consumed, the high priest gets to sit down. But it's going to have to be handled by the 24 costly priests. It can't be defiled. There's got to be a whole protocol. But he says, after this, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of Yahweh and coming in the clouds of the heavens. Then the high priest rent his garment. What should happen to him? He should die. Is he the high priest anymore? Well, hang on, it was Passover time. Who's going to officiate over the Passover for Israel that year? They didn't have a high priest to officiate over the Passover that year. The only high priest that was qualified at this time to officiate over the Passover was Yahushua, who officiated over the Passover of Israel with his disciples, all 12 with them, and he was betrayed. And then the next day he officiated over his sacrifice himself. There was no qualified high priest that year for a purpose, to say it is finished. It's transferred. All Israel, hundreds of thousands of them, did not have any high priest but Yahushua. He was the only qualified high priest in all of Judea. And he officiated over the Passover for of sacrifice for 
Israel nationally the night before, and then over his sacrifice, he fulfilled both as the Kohen Haggadah after the order of Melchizedek. Because Caiaphas tore his garments saying, he has spoken blasphemy. But really Caiaphas, according to Leviticus chapter 10 verse 6, should have died and he just annulled the Levitical priesthood. There was nobody to officiate over the morning sacrifice. There was a morning oblation and evening. There was nobody to officiate over the morning sacrifice. Who was going to officiate over the Passover sacrifice? This is so powerful and it connects now. You know what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20. And inasmuch as he, Yahushua, the Malkitzedic, was not made priest without an oath, What does that mean? Well, it was the oath of the trespass offering that transferred the priesthood over from Caiaphas to Yahushua, as was the custom. For they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him. That's what it's talking about. The oath of the trespass offering was the ultimate test of qualification for the priesthood. It was the test that Caiaphas failed. It was the test that Yahushua failed past by his testimony of his mouth and the actions of his words and deeds but still it wasn't over it could have totally gone sideways on Yahushua it could have gone sideways because now in Luke uh, in John chapter 19 it could totally go sideways and we'd all be damned for eternal destruction because in John chapter 19 23 there's a couple of feisty soldiers and they've got their hands on a special garment and if they rip that garment then then this whole thing's messed up now the, the Malchizedek priesthood would be annulled and we would have all been done for and that's just what the devil would like isn't it John chapter 19 verse 23 then the silly soldiers when they had impaled Yahushua took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam. So they had the outer garment and they courted that. But now they get to his priestly garment. It was a coat without seam woven from top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it. Oh, thank good. I mean, do you know how close we were? Death, where is uh, Satan right there was like, I've got you. I've got you. All right. So, yes, he's crucified, but I can still mess this whole thing up for humanity and still put my fist before Yahuwah. I use these government agents to do it. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Therefore they said among ourselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it should be, that the crown, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said they parted my clothes among them, and for my priestly robe did they cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Let us not tear it. Because it's the high priest's tunic and it can't be torn. Otherwise, Yahushua's priesthood would be nullified. And he hasn't sat down yet. He hasn't. It's not, it's not done yet. It's not done yet. Now we go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. I mean, my head. Wow. <sighs> Putting it together. Then he said, behold... I come to you to do your will. This is Hebrews 10, verse 9. Oh, Yahuwah, he takes away the fur. Oh, he takes away the Torah. And he brings in the New Testament. I already had a chat with my pastor about this. That was the last time I was in the Christian church. I got the right foot of fellowship over this verse. I'm like, um, excuse me. Please, sir. Can I have some more Torah? What? Please, sir, can I have some mink ha in my Torah? Get out of here! He said, Behold, I come to do your will, O Yahweh. He takes away the first sacrificial system. 
This isn't Old Testament versus New Testament. This isn't covenant. Covenant is in italics, friends, meaning it's not in the blooming text. At least the New King James is decent enough to put it in italics. It's not in the text. And I try to explain this to my pastor. And he got all the elders around me, you know, try to get the it- threats, intimidation. Try to put the pressure on Matthew. And I stood my ground. And he said, well, you know what? We'll offer you a church in the country and we'll fund it for you and everything. But, you know, you can't teach the laws of Moses. There was the coercion. There was the bribe. And I was like, this was it. I knew it. This is one of those times in your life where you, you got the devil right there. Like, look, Matthew, we'll fund a church for you. No, but it can't be in my backyard. It'll have to be in Staten. But we can help you put it together. But you've got to make a commitment that you're not going to teach the laws of Moses. And I was just like, oh. I just was, I was just gutted. And I looked and I said, I can't do that. I said, and I haven't studied it yet, but I do not believe in the pre-tribulation rapture either. And that was the end, that was the end of me in church land. That was the end. But that was, the, I had to, I've had that. And I believe any man who's had a calling has been tested and tempted to see if they depart. It's happened to me several times. What's that? Where's what? What scripture? Huh? All right. It's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. It's italicized. He takes away the first sacrificial system, not covenant, that he may establish the second. It's really priesthood, isn't it? That's the sacrificial. He takes away the first priesthood, sacrificial system, so he can establish the second, but the second is actually prior to the first. Because it's a bookend. Because it was with Abraham. It's Malkitzedek and first in origin. Oh. And every Kohen priest stands daily serving and offering the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Remember I told you that? They never actually took away the sins. It was just a covering. And then you better pray that your intentional sin got covered the next year and you didn't know. And even then it was only a covering. It was still there. The debt hadn't been removed. But this one, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of Elohim. Then it's fulfilled. Psalm 110 verse 5. He, as the Malkitzedek high priest, ascended into heaven. The work is accomplished. His garments weren't ripped. He was handled by Joseph of Arimathea and Nick at night, the appropriate people to handle the sacrifice. He was fully consumed. He was fully consumed. Don't you think he was fully consumed? He was burnt as he was transfigured. His flesh was burnt into light of resurrection. That's transfiguration. It went from one matter into another matter. Matter ceased, it does not cease to exist. But his body was burnt. You know, some would believe in the Shroud of Turin, which I think is quite interesting myself. Could be a bit dodgy, but you know, conceptually it works, it works. The high priest can only sit down once the sacrifice is fully consumed. And as the high priest, he has to stand until the sacrifice is completed. Yahushua can't sit down until it is finished. Man, this is just some... If this doesn't make your faith stronger, if this doesn't convince you more of the reality that Yahushua is the one true and only sacrifice for sin, and the only Savior and Redeemer, 
narrow is the road. Small is the gate that leads to life. And only a few shall find it. But broad is the road. Massive, massively wide is the gate that leads to perdition. And Joe Biden and everybody else, it seems, that follows him are on that broad path. No matter how many ashes he puts on his head for Ash Wednesday... That is not in the scripture, is it? Donnie, is it? No questions. No questions. Let me get to, yes, yes, question while I try and find our YouTube page because I lost it. Yes, question. Yeah. It is. Where is the, the question Donnie was asking is Hebrews chapter, cha- chapter 9. It says, verse 1, Then indeed, even the first, and covenant is there in the New King James, but it should be italicized because really it's priesthood. Then indeed, even the first priesthood had ordinances of divine service. Okay? So that that is... Um, what we're talking about here. Um, Give me a second, brethren. If you want me to get your attention or you want to get my attention, put a red line in the chat. Give us some thumbs up right now, okay? If you didn't like this, then, you know, give us some thumbs down. We can't tell how many of you didn't, but, you know, it's always the same three. Um, And um, leave us some comments below in the chat, in the comment section even. Remember, Passover is coming fast upon us, fast approaching. Go to TorahToTheTribes.com forward slash connect and sign up for the Passover. And I will see if I can, don't be in top chat, be in live chat. And let me see, let me get my spectacles, maybe, yep. Get organized here. All right. You know, um, Chris De La Rosa, how is Ryan? How is Brian? Is he there again? No, John and Ryan are not here today. If you're watching, John and Ryan, Shabbat Shalom to you, my friends. And you guys haven't registered for the Passover yet either, so you better get on it. Get on it while you can. Well, Connie Smith Mendez, Shabbat Shalom, Connie. Um, thank you. She says it's a great teaching. Well, thank you, Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. Oh, John, you are there, brother. John, Baruch Hashem. John Weaver, Yahuwah be praised forever. Blessings to you and your household, brother. All right, let's see. Let me get organized here. Still got some tea. What's happening? What's happening? Hmm. All right, calm down, Matthew. Yes, much more truth. Shabbat, Shabbat more truth. Shabbat more truth. This is my favorite part of Malchizedek fire. Caiaphas is disqualified. And yes, we're going to find that out with all of these government leaders Dis qualified in an hour in an hour in an hour question oh just styling your hair just styling your hair okay diesel grandma shabbat shalom up there in snohomish county yahuwah did think of every detail Every detail, every detail. Baruch Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. (sighs) Exactly, Christopher. Shabbat Shalom, Christopher. John the Baptist was the usurped proper Aaronic high priest, but he walked because of the corruption into the wilderness. And you and I need to do the same thing. Walk out of mystery Babylon. Get out of her, my people. It's too corrupt. Let's go off to the wilderness. Let's go get some locusts and honey.
Yeah, I don't think we should be rescuing cats, though. Do, should we? Sigh. Shh, cat ladies. Shh. Shh. Shabbat Shalom, Roger Gates. Thank you so much, Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. It's great to have you. You guys, remember, if you have not um, joined Shabbat Fellowship, you are missing out. Every Shabbat, 9 o'clock in the morning, Pacific time, brethren from all over the world fellowship together. And it has grown and such a wonderful, wonderful community. I hear such fabulous, fabulous reports. If you want to connect with people, that would be the first place to go. Go to TorahToTheTribes.com forward slash connect and connect at Shabbat Fellowship. And if you've got questions that you want to get answered during the week, then you want to join our face group books, um, groups. We've got, what, how many groups? Two? What have we got? We've got Shabbat Fellowship group. And then we've got the Malki Zedek study group. Do we have the Torah Youth Worldwide group? Not on Facebook. But those two groups, you can get in there into lots of chat and conversations, and everybody helps everybody answer and ask questions. Ah, very nice, very nice. Mm. Restoration True Name Edition, that is my favorite translation. I've got the New King James, which is my old one from the church, which has got all my pencil scrub notes in it which, you know, this is my daily, you know, if I'm just reading for, for um, not studying, but just reading just to immerse the word, then I read this. But, yeah, Restoration True Name Edition is my study scriptures. Thank you so much, Bill Crane. Shabbat shalom to you, my friend. Well, exactly, Christopher. Remember that S.A. Tan is trying to usher in his counterfeit millennium. That is so true, so true. Let's see, Ch live chat. Child of Yahuwah, you got it right, almost, almost there. Fantastic, blown my mind. Did I get this right? When we accept Yahushua, we are new creatures and we keep his commandments. By his sacrifice, we are redeemed from our, from our involuntary sin and our voluntary sin. Intentional and unintentional. You are covered if you are in him. And that means that then we produce the fruit worthy of the calling which is personal responsibility. That doesn't mean you'll be perfect, but when you fall, you'll be convicted and you'll repent and you'll turn around and come back to your creator who will restore you, just like a father and a child, child of Yahuwah. Mm -mm -mm. Beautiful stuff. Alex Napato Napolitino. Napolitino, Napolitino, Shabbat Shalom to you, Alex, Baruch Hashem, Yahuwah. Caiaphas was a Babylonian reject, truth like Velcro, yes he was. There's a lot of Babylonian rejects roaming around the streets nowadays, isn't there? Well, Shabbat Shalom, say hi to Ryan, John Weaver, Baruch Hashem, Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Well, there you have it, brethren. I hope that it unpacked well for you today, those first six chapters. And again, what a blessing. Hang on a second here. Mm. Much more truth. How's the, um, how's the old um, flood thing going? I haven't heard of that. The island blowing up and all that. The Ruach revealed to me today that all five of these offerings are found in Isaiah 53. Very nice, very nice. What's going on with the island? Much more truth. Come on, come on. Put it in the chat. Where are you now? Where have you moved to? What, what state are you in? And what's happening? I thought the mountain was falling into the sea and all that. When am I going to be on Shabbat Fellowship next? Sister Gabriella is asking from Hawahahi. 
Do you know when that's going to be? We're going to schedule it. Yes, yes, yes. Very good question, Annette Watson. Matthew, do we repent to Yahushua or to the Father? We have a greater mediator than Moshe. So, Yahushua is our mediator. He is the mediator between Yah and man. So we repent through Yahushua to the Father. We, so we can repent to Yahushua through to the Father. Because it's really in compound unity. Think of it like Moshe mediating to the Father. That's, that's the role. We have a greater mediator than Moshe. I hope that makes sense. So I would say that you repent to Yahushua, which then brings you the mediation to access your father, and then you can repent to your father, right? It's access, that mediation. So you'd have to humbly approach the mediator in, with a contrite ruach to even have access to the father. As if you were going into, you know, the queen's courts. Does that make sense? Huh? What's that? All right. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son, Baruch Hashem Yahu, Diesel Grandpa, up there in Snohomish County. Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. Well, blessings. Let me do the blessings in the honor of the Aaronic Priesthood. Blessings upon all of you. This fine, blessed, blessed Shabbat. Yevarechacha Yahuwah, Vayishmerecha. Yeyer Yahuwah Panavelecha, Vechonecha. Yesa Yahuwah Panavelecha, Vayasim Lecha, Lecha Shalom. May Yahuwah bless you and keep you. May Yahuwah's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom in the name of Yahusha. Sa shalom. We'll catch you live next Sabbath. Shalom. <laughs>